Well, hello everyone and welcome to the long awaited Stills Disease Research new, this is a long name, news and shared decision making for optimal health webinar. This is in conjunction with our efforts for Stills Disease Awareness Day that is September 7th of every year. And we had a little bit of delay in putting the webinar together because we wanted to make sure that we had all the great speakers and also all the great content to make sure that we showed you so that is why we are doing it a little bit later but that's okay because that just means we get to extend the awareness around stills disease right so my name is tiffany westridge robertson i'm the ceo of the international foundation for autoimmune and autoinflammatory arthritis we just say ai arthritis for short and i am joined here today with dr petros Ethemu. And I said at them you, so I learned that it can be pronounced both ways. So, hey there, Petros, how are you? I'm good, Tiffany. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a topic I'm very passionate about, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. Wonderful. So we apologize for the for having a little bit of a late start, but I think everybody on here can understand doctors get very busy and want to spend the adequate time with their patients, which is exactly what happens. So thank you for being a great doctor and spending that extra time with your patients, because I know we all appreciate that very much, not to be rushed through anything. So today we're going to talk about a couple different things. So first and foremost, we just want to welcome you again, and we want to point out that there is a chat feature that we have, and if you look on your uh, webinar, if you look on your, um, I don't even know what it's called, <laughs> your panel menu, panel, okay. and you're going to see a little button that says chat. So there is a drop down. So if make sure it says everyone on it. And please feel free at this time to say hello, tell us where you're tuning in from and your relationship to Stills disease. We do want this to be as interactive as possible. So we want you to be able to communicate with each other. And just keep in mind, while you can ask questions, and, and Miss Katie, who is also tuning in here with AR Arthritis, she is going to be monitoring the questions so that we will have time to, um, to talk to Dr. Epthemu and ask for his opinions. Please remember, we cannot ask specific medical questions or give advice on your specific situation. So I just want to make sure that we preface that. And just to let you know, we are recording this. And so we will make sure that everyone gets a copy of that as well. Today's topics, we're gonna to start with an overview of stills. We're gonna go into some potential complications. We're gonna get a little bit into precision medicine and what that is, as well as a personalized journey. And then we're going to just mention about some clinical trials, how that works and communicating with your doctor and some some ways that we might be able to improve that. We have a doctor right here, so let's talk about that. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Petros to get us started. All righty, you ready, Petros? I am ready, Tiffany. All right, and by the way, I'm digging the precision rheumatology and internal me medicine title. We're gonna have to revisit that because the word precision's in there and that is right up our alley. All right, here we go. And I do want to start by saying also, this is relevant for Stills disease as a continuum. We do, it does say adult onset Stills, but that's just this one slide. So take it away, Petros. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Petros Estimiu. I'm a, I'm a rheumatologist uh, in uh, New York City, uh, where my practice is. And uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, Stills disease has been a passion of mine uh, for, the, for the last 25 years. And uh, this is a disease that I, um, I, I respect, I fear sometimes, but it never uh, lets me down as being one of the most protein and uh, um, exciting diseases to work with. And I think there's a really uh, a way to help patients restore their quality of life and uh, bring them back to remission, sometimes drug-free remission. So I'll continue to work on that uh, disease. And for, for this talk, I'd like to briefly um, uh, present 
some of the latest data about the pathophysiology of the disease, the clinical presentation, some of the really important complications, including some of the really feared ones that can be life-threatening, and we always keep an eye for those, and some of the uh, you know, exciting developments that we see in both precision rheumatology, some biomarkers that may come to us, um, some ways to classify the disease, and also some interesting treatments that uh, are either uh, existing or they're underway uh, that can help us treat the entire spectrum of uh, Steele's disease. And I do believe it's a continuum. Uh, next slide. Um, and of course, it's a rare disease. So uh, a lot of physicians don't think about it. And that uh, often leads to delays in the diagnosis. Um, it's a polygenic of the inflammatory syndrome. So unfortunately, uh, we don't have um, a, a gene, uh, uh, a responsible gene or a genetic test that can uh, uh, help us um, diagnose it. Having said that, because it belongs in the autoinflammatory spectrum, I often send um, um, genetic testing to rule out uh, other um, uh, autoinflammatory diseases that can have a very uh, similar um, presentation. And I do that for many of my patients, especially if there's a typical presentation, the disease doesn't respond or present uh, the way I expect to. And um, I've been successful in differentiating that uh, in, in quite a few times. Uh, and of course, uh, if we look at um, uh, the prevalence, um, and this is data from the adult, um, understanding that in, uh, in kids, SGA is probably more common and easily diagnosed, but um, uh, when an adult presents with a symptomatology of still disease, because it's rare and people don't think about it, again, it can be a miss, but 10 patients per million, um, and uh, we see that uh, the prevalence is increasing, could it be suddenly disease per se, or are we better? Are we getting better in diagnosing it? Um, and uh, look at incidence, the number of new cases, uh, depending on the population study, then uh, where they come from, uh, looking at different institutions and different countries, it seems that uh, can be one to 10 new cases per million per year. Um, but in some groups, it can be as high as 34. So it may not be as rare as we think it is. And maybe we should think about it um, you know, uh, more frequently. Uh, and of course, that, that there's the continuum, still continuum. We used to um, you know, uh, think of it as, oh, there's SGIA and um, systemic journal idiopathic arthritis, uh, formerly called Stills disease and now adult Stills disease. And we, now we think of those two modes as a continuum with the same disease, same um, uh, presentation, response to treatments and so forth. But it, there, there are two peaks in the presentation. One is uh, um, uh, in younger, I mean, that, I mean obviously the SGI is in much younger kids. And then looking at the adults, which can affect the, uh, the entire spectrum, we see a couple of more peaks, one between 15 and 25, and then another one maybe later in life in the 30s and 40s, but it can affect um, uh, every patient. I mean, we're talking about the bimodal thing in the, in the initial presentation or the initial episode that can trigger the diagnosis of uh, Stills disease. Um, so we, when you see an older adult, and we did a study among hospitalized patients, uh, me and my collaborator, Dr. Meta from uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery, she wanted to be here with us today, but she had a family emergency and she had to fly to India. Uh, we found that um, uh, you know patients, uh, middle-aged, older patients can have still disease. Uh, they do get hospitalized. They can get complications. So the idea that it's only a disease for young, uh, for children, uh, young adults, um, uh, is only true for the initial presentation. But those patients obviously live. They accumulate comorbidities. So we should always be looking for that and take it into consideration. Uh, and of course, the diagnosis. Uh, I've seen. Uh, uh, diagnosis being delayed, uh, especially when the patients reads more the articular pattern uh, for even many, many years, but uh, typically within six months and a year. Next slide. Uh, there's been some association with some HLE uh, alleles. So there's some gen these are some genes. Uh, uh, but uh, when we look at around the world, 
uh, some of the associations are found in some populations, but not in others. So uh, there's not the universal genetic background that we can associate with still disease. Uh, there've been some um, uh, temporal associations, some viruses and uh, microbes. Um, we don't think of as etiologic, but maybe we think that uh, maybe they trigger the immune system and they can unveil or unmask uh, uh, stills disease. Uh, which, um, you know, obviously it's an auto-inflammatory disease, have a life of its own. So it's not an infectious disease, but maybe a prior uh, infectious, uh, um, a prior infection can initiate the, the trigger, the hyperactivity of the immune system, especially the innate uh, immune system and, and lead to the presentation of still disease. Um, and of course we found that, uh, you know, they're clear, there's clear evidence of uh, immune uh, system uh, hyperactivity and dysregulations. Uh, we see some particular cytokines in the leukine one, L6, L18, um, uh, maybe tumor necrosis factor, um, TOLAC receptor 7, and others uh, that are still being discovered. So there's definitely a hyperactivity of the innate uh, immune system and pro-inflammatory cytokines that some of them can become targets for therapeutic interventions. Uh, next um, slide. And I'm showing here the, the continuum of still disease, right, between uh, SGI, children's and adolescents, and uh, adult still disease. We start thinking more and more about um, uh, you know, one disease with different uh, mode, uh, different peaks in presentation. Um, uh, so it can be pretty artificial. Uh, so traditionally, the first presentation uh, was uh, 60 years or older, we'd talk about adult also still disease. It was before that would be SGIA. But these days, you know, we think of it again as a continuum. And if you ask many patients that may have the diagnosis of adult still disease, sometimes you'll get a history of a patient that was you know, spend a month in the hospital when I was a kid, but nobody knew what they had or something like that. So uh, it can be more artificial than, than biologic. Um, we do see a similar um, uh, phenotype uh, between those two, um, yeah, between the adult stills and the SGIA. Uh, it seems to be looking one, uh, plays a major role as a pivotal cytokine, but also IL-6 and IL-18. Uh, uh, seem to play a major role and maybe uh, a different role in different subtypes. Uh, so maybe a more uh, IL-6 may have more of a role in uh, the arthritic component where systemic ones uh, could be more uh, IL-1, IL-2 dependent. And that's an area of intense uh, uh, research right now uh, because we also found that the uh, axis between uh, interleukin-18 levels and interferon gamma, which is uh, can lead to complications like macrophage activation syndrome. Um, so similar uh, peripheral gene expression signatures. So all that data that accumulated over the years that help us talk about these days about still disease, a continuum of still disease uh, across ages and across presentations. Next slide. Uh, so this is a very complicated cartoon, obviously showing some of the uh, mechanisms, the underlying uh, pathogenetic mechanisms. Uh, that may be uh, involved in the uh, um, pathogenesis of still disease. So we see that innate immune system, which is a, a more ancient, um, but extremely powerful and fast part of our immune system. It's not specific like the adaptive immunity where we have uh, specific autoantibodies or these receptors that recognize a specific uh, uh, antigen, but these um, more ancient and primitive, but Again, very fast, very powerful, essential part of the immune system, the innate immunity, uh, recognize danger signals. Um, and then it, uh, by using very effective pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, like in the leukine one, for example, um, can lead to the elimination of some uh, pathogens because, or other danger um, uh, signals from microbes and viruses and can clear them out uh, you know, a lot faster than the adaptive immunity that takes longer. Uh, next slide. So um, traditionally we thought of still disease having three stages or three different presentations. Um, uh, so uh, some lucky patients have a monocyclic, you know, single episode, uh, but many have multiple uh, episodes and intermittent flares. Um, those two, uh, 
uh, subcategories usually have a lot of systemic uh, findings, the fever, rash, um, maybe arthritis, and um, they present differently than someone who goes in the chronic articular pattern, um, which uh, has worse prognosis, and those patients have a lot of arthritis, sometimes destructive arthritis, and some of the uh, early systemic findings, the fever, the rash, may not be um, uh, present anymore, or may not be as prominent. So um, these days we're trying to simplify things more. So we start talking about, um, you know, systemic uh, stills and articular stills, uh, because that has a uh, effect on the way we talk about them, diagnose them and treat them. Next slide. So again, this is a typical still triad that um, uh, you know a lot of people think about it, but it may not be there all of the components at the same time. Uh, I try to teach my uh, medical students, residents, and fellows that um, uh, while it's it, it's great for textbook, it's great for uh, as a mnemonic to think about it. Um, it you know, you you don't need all uh, all components to be present at the same time to make the diagnosis. Otherwise, it's going to be delayed or missed. Of course, fevers uh, above 39.5 degrees Celsius. Um, there is uh, seems to be a circadian rhythm to that. So uh, early afternoon or evening, uh, uh, you can get that uh, together with the evanescent rash. So uh, unfortunately, this is around the time there's a, all, uh, many times a shift change. So I, I asked my uh, uh, trainees to make sure you sign out to the evening team to you know, uh, address, you know, take the temperature and address the patient to look for the rash because it can be present around 4 or 5 p.m. when the morning team left and the evening team has taken over. And I think that helped us diagnose many, uh, many patients. The rash, it can be very um, typically uh, uh, described as evanescent salmon color. And of course, we see that they can have many different variations. So um, uh, many times it doesn't disappear in between, it just becomes more prominent or more pruritic. Uh, there are different rashes that have been seen, some even vasculitic. Um, so very protein disease. So uh, sometimes two uh, uh, still spaces can look very different from each other. Um, but these are some of the um, uh, presentations and the rash can, can actually cover a, a lot of the uh, trunk, um, the, the, the chest, uh, upper abdomen, you know, the back, and many times it spares the distal extremity. So I always ask my trainees to please undress and examine the patient. And of course, arthritis may not be as prominent or maybe even be absent in the early, very early stages where the systemic findings like the fever and the rash take a prominent role. Um, uh, sometimes um, it, it's a minor component or it comes later. So it may not be um, as prominent early on, but uh, I think it takes more of a role. And of course, if it's an ex experienced examiner, I can often see some synovitis in wrists, ankles, and maybe knees, some uh, larger joints, um, but may not be the, the predominant or the most pressing symptom early on in the presentation. Next slide. Uh, so looking at some of the uh, uh, additional features, uh, we look for um, enlarged liver and spleen, hepatosplenomegaly, pleurisy, you know, that uh, deep, uh, both, both for the chest and abdomen. So uh, let's say uh, uh, chest pain with uh, coughing or um, uh, and discomfort in abdomen, you know, from the peritoneum. Uh, pericarditis is very common. So the lining of the heart uh, can, um, uh, can lead to, uh, to chest pain, um, uh, even mimic a heart attack. Um, and it does improve with treatment, but um, uh, these are, can be some of the, the common manifestations and sometimes can be recurrent, can be chronic. So we have to look at the whole body as a whole and look at the, 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 some of the um, end organs that may be affected. Lymphadenopathy, uh, uh, diffuse, uh, swollen, sometimes painful uh, lymph nodes um, can be quite common and sometimes can be uh, mistaken for a hematologic malignancy like lymphoma, they can also have also fevers, type B symptoms. So um, uh, sometimes we make the diagnosis uh, because they find the enlarged lymph nodes, they have fever, they feel lymphoma, but then they do the biopsy, it can be uh, uh, seen as reactive and not malignant, and then it can be part of the presentation. Uh, pharyngitis, um, common and sometimes the prodrome, 
Uh, I've seen some patients up to six months before they have the full presentation of uh, Still's disease. It's thought to be um, a common problem, maybe a little more common in adults. Um, and uh, you know, there have been some studies from from, uh, from Asia where they looked at this um, actual inflammation in the, uh, in the cartilage surrounding uh, the uh, uh, the trachea, and kind of, and it's not really an infectious. Uh, thing, but uh, a clear and common prodrome. So I was asked for that. Next slide. Uh, so I'm showing here, you know, and this is another uh, indication of the uh, stills continuum because on the left there's a SGIA, there's a, ch a child, and then, uh, uh, you know, on the right says uh, adult stills is one of my patients, a very lovely. Uh, 18, 19 year old uh, patient, now a college student. Um, for a long time, she thought she was being treated for presumed Lyme disease, but it was clear still disease. And unfortunately, you see that the wrist is ankylosed. So um, you see here that the uh, the bones have lost their contour, right? They're becoming uh, one block. Uh, they're just stuck to each other. The, the patient's lost some mobility, uh, kind of fully extend. Um, her wrist, uh, but I can I, I can assure you that with treatment the, the patient doing much better. And now she's a very um, active uh, college student. She's able to 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 enjoy life and go to college, and uh, uh, she's very successful. But when I first saw her, she was very limited. She was barely was able to extend her uh, wrist. And uh, the arthritis, what I'm trying to say is it can, it can settle in quite rapidly in the absence of treatment. So I always look for that. And it is, uh, can be a destructive arthritis with a predilection for wrists, but also ankles and I mean, let, let's say so, um, knees, but that's a target uh, joint. And I always look for that because when, once ankylosis settles in, it's hard to undo it. Okay, next slide. So comorbidities, and of course, this may be more prevalent for, for an adult where, uh, you know, <clears throat> patients with stills obviously do well, the age, they accumulate comorbidities, and maybe there's a correlation. And we always look for, um, uh, for, uh, for example, cardiovascular, uh, infectious complications. Um, and uh, uh, in this slide, we show men and women, men in blue, women in red, and um, uh, some comorbidities, especially infections, but also maybe cardiovascular, um, uh, it's unclear about malignancies, can be more common in patients with still disease. So it's important to look at them as a whole and obviously monitor for other comorbidities because there may be correlation between ongoing chronic inflammation um, uh, and uh, treatment, medication and on, and some of those complications as well. So next slide. Uh, and of course, when we're in complications, um, we need to think about the whole body because it's affected, it's a systemic disease. Um, and uh, fortunately, some of them are quite rare, like pure cell aplasia, but there's uh, definitely an increased risk for pericarditis, uh, hepatitis, um, uh, rarely uh, myocarditis affecting the heart, um, uh, strokes, uh, microangiopathy, DIC, uh, which is a life threatening complication, MAS, infections. Um, uh, and uh, we, all, we always look for that. So, uh, luckily, they, um, they don't always present and uh, maybe a small subset. So, recently there was a publication from a French group suggested that um, not every patient still is uh, um, at risk for those, but there's a subset and they called it catastrophic still disease. Um, uh, and there may be something in these particular groups that maybe is more susceptible for, you know, DIC, MAS uh, and worse complications. But uh, the, math, uh, the fact of the matter is that we always screen our patients, we look at the whole body and we're ready if there's any signs of a complication to intensify treatment uh, uh, admit the patient to a, a, a intensive care unit and be aggressive to prevent the organ damage. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, so what do I do when I see a patient with stills in the office? Of course, um, we need to be careful um, because there are many mimickers uh, that can be either autoimmune, autoinflammatory diseases, malignancies, infections, um, 
and uh, uh, a careful uh, exclusion of other, maybe more common etiologies is important before we settle in on the diagnosis of still disease. Um, you, know, you know, we're gonna take a very close uh, look at the uh, febrile patterns, uh, the, but also the rash, the arthritis uh, and other symptoms. Um, we're gonna look for um, uh, risk factors, uh, maybe predisposing uh, factors or only any triggers of immune cell hyperactivity. And um, of course, we're gonna look at what the patient has tried and failed before. But again, we should be very careful because not only the medication, but the duration and the dosing are important before we say someone did not respond to particular treatment. Um, uh, because some of the manifestations can be uh, related to, to, for example, the fever, the attacks, uh, may not be present while I'm there, but um, I think it's always, you know, most of my patients now will bring their cell phones and they're gonna show me the pictures uh, from that. So and sometimes they'll, they'll send them in between. Um, and, and of course, they're looking for hepatosclinomegaly, lymphadenopathy. Um, uh, I would pay special attention to the heart because it can be a target organ. And of course, the joints. I'm a rheumatologist and I'm going to look for disease activity, but also damage, ankylosis, and loss of uh, function and uh, range of motion. Next slide. Um, Lab tests. Uh, I, I I send a lot of lab tests because I find them helpful. I mean, they're not diagnostic by any means, but they give me a good idea of how active the disease is. Has there been any damage? Uh, can I rule out, uh, helps me rule out other diseases that can mimic? And um, uh, it's also quite helpful when you start suspecting a possible complication, especially MAS, because some of the site opinions and some of the um, uh, the, the blood tests can be indicative that we're you know, moving toward that direction. So this is a list of the medication I use and I use them quite frequently. Again, by, by themselves, they're not uh, uh, diagnosed in any way, but together with the physical exam and the presentation, they tell a story and it helps me uh, not only make the diagnosis, but also prognosticate and um, uh, hopefully diagnose uh, early uh, and promptly uh, possible complication before it becomes a real problem. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there are some, uh, you know, some of those blood tests are available uh, commercially. Some of them can be, you know, uh, more of a, a experimental part of a research laboratory. Um, so we, we expect that the next few years we're going to be seeing more biomarkers, uh, maybe uh, free in the leukemia 18 or others that can help us uh, not only monitor the disease, but also associate with some of the complications. But even the regular blood tests, they're extremely helpful uh, in um, assessing the, the state of the, uh, of the individual, the patient, uh, how active the disease is, and uh, um, what should be, you know, they also sometimes uh, give us some little red flags that the patient may go into a serious uh, life-threatening complication. Uh, next slide. Uh, and I, I already showed you some of the x-rays, not particularly helpful early on, but I show you that damage sometimes can happen quite early in aggressive diseases. So I try to get um, you know, a baseline uh, x-ray, um, uh, but we, now we also have more uh, sensitive modalities like you know, MRI, musculoskeletal ultrasound. So sometimes they can give us an idea that what we treat, what we're dealing with is inflammatory and maybe, uh, you know, it's ongoing activity that down the line may, may, may uh, lead to uh, radiographic damage. So the time to intervene is then before the damage settles in, because again, we can undo that. So it can be, it, it's, it, it's not the most helpful, but can in adjunct together with that, the rest of it um, can assess damage and maybe uh, help us differentiate uh, disease activity in some affected joints. Next slide. And this is my diagnostic approach is the, from the paper I published. Uh, again, uh, high um, uh, clinical suspicion is important, but, uh, but it's also important to be very careful and, and uh, uh, detail-oriented, um, ruling out systemic conditions that uh, can mimic that or can complicate that. So it, it can take a little longer, um, uh, but it's important because I've seen uh, or I've heard of uh, cases where, you know, uh, if you rush to make the diagnosis of still disease and not be careful ruling out some other disease that are treatable like infection or malignancy, 
then uh, you can you can miss something and you don't want that. But once the diagnosis is made and established, you know we follow them both clinically and serologically, um, and we use radiographic um, radiographs as adjunct if we suspect damage or um, to look at a particular uh, joint uh, target joint. Next slide. Uh, so, of course, there's a number of diagnostic criteria. There's a separate set of SGIA criteria uh, that uh, are well published and, you know, they're, they're helpful. There's also MAS criteria. Uh, for adults, there's a set of criteria like Yamaguchi or Fotrell. Um, and those are more, um, you know, they're great for classification criteria because I'm the patient in the study. But as I said, it's such a protein disease that can trick you. So having, you know, uh, high... Uh, suspicion uh, for that. Uh, you may see that the patient, early patient, may look like a form fruit, but later in the disease, they, they can fulfill those. But uh, we don't wait for the patient to fulfill all the criteria, check all the marks. It's important to, um, you know, keep a mind, open mind, and uh, especially if they're going to have a very active disease uh, to, to make the diagnosis. So the difference between diagnostic and classification criteria, uh, they both have a place. But there's no, but uh, clinical experience and suspicion um, can be very helpful in uh, finding and, uh, and treating those early cases where they may have some manifestations, but they're still developing them. Next slide. Uh, and of course, we, we will do a due diligence. We're going to rule out other diseases. I can tell you that some of them uh, can, can manifest uh, at, at, at certain stages very similar to still disease, or they can have similar presentation or, or even laboratory values. So um, a careful uh, workup, especially early on, is really important uh, before we, we start uh, systemic treatments. Next slide. And of course, our goals is control the inflammation, right? Uh, make the, the patient comfortable, uh, stop uh, unopposed inflammation systemic that can lead to complications. Um, uh, we want to prevent joint injury. I already showed you that can happen very early on. That's preventable. I promise you that we treat early on. We don't let the damage settle. We want to minimize the risk of uh, treatment-related adverse events. So very careful monitoring, both clinically and uh, blood tests serologically, is really important. Um, that, uh, identifying, diagnosing, treating complication can be life-saving. And of course, we always want to think long-term. Um, can we address the patient concerns, the burden of disease? That can be both uh, physical, but it can be mental as well. And of course, when it's really gratifying when we get a patient that um, uh, is really affected by the disease, we bring them to remission. And uh, I can tell you personally, I had many young patients that was able to take them off medication and uh, you know lead them to drug-free remission. I mean. Uh, Doing this to the young patient will you know, start uh, their lives uh, is one of the most gratifying things of my uh, career. Next slide. Um, and of course, the treatment will vary um, between severity um, uh, and uh, specific organ manifestations. So these days, I mean, this, uh, this is the older uh, slide we are much more aggressive, we're much more comfortable targeted treatments because number one, uh, we know that what works, what doesn't. Uh, also, we want to avoid uh, uh, cumulative uh, steroid exposure because we know we're going to pay the price down the line. And I think we're getting better at treating that. And some of the difference that we used to see between the um, uh, pediatric population and adults, um, uh, where obviously there was a lot of... Um, uh, correctly, a uh, concern about using steroids for kids and uh, impeding their growth uh, and going straight to a biologic treatment. I start seeing that, uh, fortunately, it happens to adults as well. Uh, and that's uh, uh, and that's why I think it's important to, to think about the still continuing unifying the disease. Next slide. Um, and of course, um, you know, that, that uh, distinction uh, can be important between systemic and chronic articular. Uh, chronic articular often follows the systemic. Not everybody will go uh, to chronic articular, uh, but that may uh, have an effect on how we, we treat the patient, what agents we use, and uh, uh, also the chronicity of treatment. Next slide. Uh, so this is an evolving algorithm. Uh, as I said, um, 
uh, I think these days we're much more uh, eager uh, to go to a targeted treatment. Um, for adults, obviously we use more, may use more um, methotrexate or uh, uh, corticosteroids early on. But as I said, I'm seeing the trend uh, for, um, for ta targeted treatments and our understanding is evolving. And I think we're gonna have more tools in the, in, you know, in the near future. Next slide. Uh, and there's a wide variety of medication being used. Uh, many of them were um, borrowed from other inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, for example, uh, but we also start seeing uh, specific agents that uh, are very effective for uh, this disease alone. And uh, we start separating this disease from others, but there's some overlap and some agents that can be used across the board. So that's why rheumatologists are um, very well equipped to treat this disease because they, they have experience for many of those drugs from maybe from other disease states where they're being used more or for longer. Next slide. Uh, and again, no standard approach, uh, no uh, substitute for experience. Um, I tell my patients to let me know uh, if there's any worrisome uh, change or complication because some patients can go to MAS quite quickly. Uh, also, uh, very, you know, want to look for treatment related side effects because we cannot ignore those. And uh, there, there, there are ways around it. We have alternatives, we have strategies for that. Um, and uh, when uh, people tell me, oh, this is just another arthritis, I try to remind them of those re fortunately rare, but life-threatening uh, complications that can change the, the, uh, the clinical history quite rapidly. Uh, so that's always a concern, something always in the back of our minds. Next slide. And there we go. We have hit the end of that lovely presentation. Thank you so much. That was very, we've had some questions coming in too. Uh, in the in the chat, so I'm going to ask Miss Katie to come back on and and um, and filter. She's been filtering those for you. So this is the part of this webinar that we're going to continue the conversation. So again, just keep in mind that we can't answer personal treatment questions. And anything that was covered here in part one of this webinar that are questions that you might have, please um, keep them coming in and keep that discussion going strong. In the meantime, I'm gonna turn it over to Miss Katie to pull out some of those questions and, and for Petros. Sure, so um, of course I know that not every answer might be answerable because a lot depends on the specific patient and you can't give out specific medical advice, but uh, hopefully most of them can be answered. Um, so one from Kathleen in the chat, um, has there been any correlation with Stills disease and multiple sclerosis? Um, not to, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Um, and does stills, uh, must involve a rash? Um, in the majority of cases, yes. But as I said, um, if, uh, in the chronic articular pattern, uh, there may be no rash at all. So, uh, as I was mentioning before, don't, I tell my, pay, my, my trainees, don't expect all of them to be present or all of them to be present at the same time. Uh, it varies uh, from the time of the day to the disease activity, to what pattern the disease has um, and what medication they're under. So when it's there, uh, especially early on in the disease state when systemic symptoms are there, it helps us with the diagnosis and we often do biopsies and the, the uh, histologic pattern can help us eliminate some uh, other things, but uh, also it has a, a pattern usually um, uh, the polymorphic nuclear cells um, coalescing. Um, but uh, again, it can be so protein. There have been four or five different kinds of rashes being uh, uh, you know, described for still disease. There is a, one that most people are familiar with, but the others that can be a little less uh, obvious. Uh, so it's part of the disease. And of course, it's a, it's a, uh, we take it uh, in great consideration and often helps us diagnose the patient. Interesting. All right, so we've gotten a several more in the chat. Um, so um, Chris wants to know, what are the warning signs that your AOSD is becoming chronic? Right, so I think, um, again, uh, fortunately, around 40% of the patients uh, do that. Um, I think it's, we'll see a transition when it starts, um, you know, some of the early signs of 
uh, we associate with still disease, uh, the fever, the rash, are, they may be still be there, uh, but sometimes they may not be there. But the arthritis takes a more prominent role. And uh, uh, many cases, it can almost mimic almost identically uh, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. I suspect that many cases of uh, called seronegative array, um, and they can fulfill the criteria of rheumatoid arthritis uh, for sure, but they don't have the typical uh, autoantibodies associated with it. Could be chronic articular steals. Hard for me to prove that, uh, but you'll see that you know we see that those patients may not respond to the uh, usual treatments that, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. So they may respond to some but not others. So uh, it could be you know steals that develop to the chronic articular after many years and the the absence of uh, of you know what people think about the fever and the rash um, uh, prevents them from from making the association. It, it's quite possible. Okay, and then uh, a couple questions as far as, and my apologies, I'm trying to find a few of them. Um, one asks about combining bi biologics and still. So I think, and another one was combining several different treatments together. So one difference, I think one or the other DMART or biologic, like a combination of them. Is there research being done in that area? Yes and no. I mean, there's, um, I think there's a, some hesitancy in combining biologics because we try to do it for other disease states, mostly RA in the past and they increased the infection risk. But now that we have multiple new uh, agents coming, uh, there's that idea of stacking. And as I've spoken, uh, we've spoken before in, a, a, in another meeting with our, our pediatric colleagues. So uh, the idea is for patients that we can reach remission, uh, we may, it may be smart to look for combinations, not necessarily biologic, it could be biologic with an with a oral agent uh, signal inhibitor um, that uh, can help us uh, reach remission for sure. Um, I think it's even more pressing in some of the severe complications. In, in the pediatric business, we've done that, uh, not so much with the adults, but I think in the future, it's going to be to find combination treatments that may be uh, effective for uh, those really refractory patients, but they also need to be safe um, for them. So that's that's an exciting um, uh, part that's really uh, being discussed and some uh, good research being done on that. And I think in the future, we're gonna have combination treatments uh, and we can, we can bring to remission a larger, number of patients, but that, that's an excellent question. That's exactly where the field is going to right now. Oh, that's interesting um, and hopeful. Um, uh, so another question from Susan, uh, is a diagnosis after 60 rare? Um, well, yes and no. Um, I think that if it's an initial episode, um, uh, it, it's it's rare, but, but as I said, we've done studies and we've seen patients in the 50s and 60s, you know, that being hospitalized, maybe because they have more comorbidities, you know, uh, but with a clear diagnosis of still disease. Uh, could it be a recurrence? And we've seen recurrences that can be far apart. So maybe the, uh, the initial episode was not diagnosed as stills. So again, we've seen that. We've seen that in patients that we thought were new onset dull stills, but um, some further digging uh, uh, came out that they, they may have had the first episode with their children. So in this case, technically with SGIA, or if we're broad-minded, we're gonna call it the stills continue. Um, so as a first episode, it's rare, but it could be a recurrence that we may not have associated necessarily with uh, something that happened early in life and may have been forgotten or been you know, diagnosed as something else. Awesome. All right, uh, thank you so much for those answers. I think we're gonna move on right now. Um, and as Tiffany mentioned in the chat, um, that anything we don't answer right now, we will do our best to follow up later with answers to everyone's questions as best as we can. So, Great. Tiffany? All right, thanks, Katie. So I have a couple extra questions that I'd like to ask as well. So we were talking about mass in particular. Uh, microphage activation syndrome. And in one of the slides, it said uh, it said something about rheumatologists and monitoring the signs. I was wondering if you could just give us a little more information 
for the people living with Stills disease, what are the signs? What should they be looking for? Um, and when should they contact you? Or is this a hospital situation? Uh, yes, so that's that's a great question. Um, you know, it's uh, sometimes it can be the initial manifestation and you meet the, the patient for the first time in, in the hospital. Um, uh, sometimes can be a patient you had and you know, they they may start developing the complication. Could it be the disease per se, or maybe also an additional external factor? And we identify sometimes uh, viral infections, like, like the patient that developed, you know, had the superimposed CMV infection, uh, so the virus that triggered the transition to um, MAS, for example. And uh, she was a young um, uh, law student. I had to beg her to go to the hospital. And she stayed, you know, uh, she, she stayed for two months in the ICU, but she did a complete recovery. That was very gratifying. Um, but uh, there are signs, um, you know, uh, for example, people start uh, having a very high fevers or um, nuanced rash. I mean, the ferritin can go sky high. Um, that we can see the cytopenias, dropping of the platelets, the red blood cells. The, yeah, even the white cells and maybe paradoxically dropping of the um, uh, of the set rate, um, we may see um, uh, you know increased um, fibrinogen and uh, uh, triglycerides. Um, so a patient that may have been previously well controlled suddenly becomes very sick. Um, so I think it's really important to never really drop your guard, and because some of the patients that we think they're stable and they respond well to treatment will go to that, maybe a superimposed factor like an infection that can lead them to that. And there are some patients that have this catastrophic subvariant that um, for uh, reasons we're not fully understand, uh, they just go straight to, to this complication and you need to have all hands on, uh, on deck and uh, high, you know, uh, aggressive treatment to um, uh, reverse that. Great, and I think you answered this question, but Jenny meant, asked in the chat, can MAS happen at any time, even years down the line? I think that the answer to that is yes, correct? Yes, I mean, obviously, as I said, there's that, uh, they call it the catastrophic stills. Uh, it, this group, it may happen early on, even with presentation, but as, as I said, I had patients that, um, so the, in the beginning of the diagnosis, a little bit higher risk, but I've also seen patients that, maybe they had a superimposed um, uh, factor. So it, that two hit hypothesis where they were previously well controlled and something happened and they, they went to MAS. And also see patients where they kind of um, uh, oscillate between uh, AOSD on one part and uh, MAS on the other one. And we, we see sometimes with treatment, we can, we can modify that, sometimes we can't. Uh, and that's in the literature. So um, I, I always worry a little more about those patients. That they're little, uh, you know, they, they're definitely stills, but they have those elements that make you think that this patient may slide more to MAS. So I keep a closer eye and maybe um, a more aggressive monitoring. Okay, great. I'm gonna skip over a couple of these. If you're like, whoa, she just went past the slide. That's because we've actually covered it. So I had a lot of questions that we wanted to follow up with, but you all have been such a great audience and participation that you've asked a lot of these. So if you see me jump through real quick in lieu of time, it's because you already asked these wonderful questions. So thank you for that. So I just wanted to touch on this a little bit more. Uh, we did bring it up in the, in the presentation that Petros gave which is about precision medicine. And this is something that we believe at AI Arthritis that patients should really start to understand because it is an evolution in research and it's something that is really exciting. A couple of things that you mentioned, Petros, was you said diagnosis, monitoring, and potential complications. And I thought, I was just wondering if you could just give us a little bit more information as people living with the diseases, what is precision medicine in regards to helping diagnosis, monitor potential complications and what's happening specific in stills? I actually did a little screenshot too of some of the targets that you mentioned over the side. I thought you could include that because I think some patients are familiar with those terms like IL-1 or IL-6 and how that kind of relates to the bigger picture of precision medicine. 
Absolutely. So um, I think we understand more and more. Um, we're fortunate uh, that um, uh, you know there are uh, multiple L1 inhibitors and L6 inhibitors, and I think the next, there are at least three L18 inhibitors in development that I know uh, right now. So it seems we're going to have more and more tools in our momentarium uh, to treat uh, patients, and hopefully we're going to have some biomarkers that will help us. Um, uh, you know, choose the best agent from the beginning instead of, you know, that trial and error. Uh, there was a provocative paper uh, written a, a few years ago where some investigators said, well, should we, um, uh, you know, use maybe L1 inhibitors for, for patients that have more systemic findings uh, and maybe, um, uh, you know, save or reserve L6 inhibitors for other failures or maybe patients with a more uh, arthritic phenotype. Uh, I think it was a provocative paper, it helped us think about it. Uh, in reality, it's not as simple. Uh, we've seen patients that for unexplained reasons may respond one to the other, um, but there may be some truth into that. Um, but obviously we need more, um, you know, uh, target agents. I think there's big call for IT inhibitors. There's now three um, inflammasome inhibitors in development, but far down the line. Uh, there were some provocative papers that JAK inhibitors may um, be effective in this disease, in, uh, in especially, you know, uh, that came, uh, many of them came from China. Uh, so that's something that, uh, you know, may be used for, for some patients. Uh, uh, we definitely need more studies on that for both the efficacy and safety. Um, and uh, um, obviously there's, um, there's a lot of development, not only in uh, stilsis per se, but uh, auto-inflammatory. Uh, uh, the auto-inflammatory disease have a renaissance. I mean, there's almost a new one being discovered every year from NIH. And I think there's a lot of interest um, in the mechanism and maybe do a more precision, you know, uh, uh, medicine, knowing the mechanism and maybe finding the agent that has the, the potential to affect it more with the least amount of side effects. So um, we, we're doing so much better than we did 20 years ago where that, that was at its infancy. I think we're getting reaching the area of maturity and I hope, I hope that there's gonna be some biomarkers that will help both diagnosis but also disease monitoring in the next few years. But it's definitely a much better time to, to be a stills patient and we had some uh, really spectacular um, uh, developments the, the last few years. Yes, definitely. I know our organization, we attend the American College of Rheumatology and also you are every year. Actually, that's how I even knew about you in the first place, because I've seen you speak at these conferences before, and we've just been seeing it more and more. It's very, it's a, it's a very exciting time for uh, these conditions, because the more we can identify these biomarkers and how it, these match what is in your personal signature as a person living with the diseases, the better the, the better we can diagnose, the better we can match a person to the right treatment rather than a, a trial and error. And as mentioned, it could even help identify who might have negative side effects. So really, really exciting times. Uh, so as we go into the last sort of 10 minutes, 15 minutes of this, this discussion, I wanted to also talk about a little bit of the holistic or full body disease therapy options. And I was just wondering, I, and we actually had this question as well, because there are other options in addition to pharmacologic or using biologics or disease modifying agents. How do you uh, deal with the communications, Petros, when if, if patients are looking for also other alternatives in addition to the treatments? What are your recommendations and how do you how do you recommend that our patients listening in open the conversation with their doctors about non-pharmacologic options as well? Well, I think, you know, everybody's different. We need to look as, as a whole. So uh, I often get questions about, you know, proper diets or, or supplements, and we need to look at them into, you know, its individual situation. Um, is it something that it's safe for the patient, something that, that, that's helping, in, in, you know, uh, adjunct to pharmacologic treatment? Um, and uh, I think many times we, we, can, we can come with a plan that's going to be beneficial and safe for the patient. So I'm, I'm a really uh, big proponent of 
holistic medicine and you know making sure that uh, we address uh, the patient's needs and special situation also the, the clinical presentation so but I, I, I often find that it's the combination of a, of a targeted sound and, uh, and reasonable pharmacology treatment with the other modalities that can you know lead us to the best results. Great. So we are going to talk just briefly. I'm not going to go through this whole slide. Just wanted to also bring up clinical trials because as we were talking about all of these different treatments, and they come from somewhere. So in order for the treatments to get to our doctor's offices and even get to the point where our, we're able to utilize these treatments, they go through a process. And this process can take many years. And there's these studies that involve all, uh, people like yourself living with the diseases. And the, the studies help researchers determine if the product is safe and effective, how effective, and then it, go, it just goes through these phases. So that is how we get to these getting on market. And then we, we do ask because patients are often asked, well, we have to participate because if there isn't participation in the trials, then the product can't ever get to the end. So I wanted to just briefly ask you, Petros, because obviously there needs to be participation and some people might want to participate because they would have access to getting these medications elsewhere, possibly just exhausted all options, just disease control. So I wanted to ask you, when is the right time, if at all, for a person with Stills disease to participate in a clinical trial? And how should the patient approach you if they are interested? Absolutely. So, I mean, obviously there's a, a, a big need uh, for, um, uh, for clinical trials, especially since we have some uh, exciting new agents that could be very, very beneficial. And, um, uh, you know, some of them, may be already available for other diseases, but some of those agents uh, are brand new. They're not currently available outside the clinical trial setting. And that can be helpful, especially for someone uh, who has tried and failed all the treatments and uh, you know, they, uh, they may be looking for, for an alternative. Um, so uh, that can be an important um, uh, solution uh, to that. Um, especially if the agent is not commercially available for any other disease. Sometimes I see, you know, patients say, well, you know, I, I would like to help the clinical study, but at the same time, I know this agent is available, maybe for a different indication, and I don't um, uh, want to run the risk of, you know, being the placebo. Most of the studies, uh, fortunately, that I've seen in uh, still disease, because many of the agents work so fast and effective, uh, they only have a very short um, uh, time before, you know, the, the investigator can decide whether you're going to um, uh, switch you to placebo, or maybe uh, they have uh, the studies and where everybody gets the, the drug, and then for a short period of time, they may randomize you to placebo, the active uh, group, and they're looking for, for a flare with minimal risk for, for the patient. So in these situations, it's important to, uh, to get more knowledge and get uh, disease-specific treatments, uh, especially if they're not available anywhere else. And uh, I think the investigators design studies and the institutional review boards always take into consideration the, the safety and the uh, um, convenience of the patients. So if they are going to be on the um, you know, placebo group, it's going to be for a short period of time. And then if there are signs of worsening, then there's what's called the escape clauses where everybody, where people you know, get the, the treatment. Uh, but I think it's important. I think that's how the, the, uh, the, the group uh, will, um, and the disease will move forward and we're gonna get new treatments. And I think it's important, um, and I've started seeing already that we start unifying, you know, the stills continue. So we, still, we see uh, studies for new agents that include both adult uh, onset and SGIA, since we understand it's part of the same disease. And uh, they include them in the study. So now we can get hopefully treatments across the entire continuum of Stills disease. Great. Thank you for really going into sort of the importance as well. Of, I, I think that this is something, well, I don't think, this is something that our organization is really trying to work hard on for education 
Um, so as far as uh, I just wanted to give everyone here a tool. So if you are still on, I see a lot of almost everybody is still on. So that's great. We have at AR Arthritis developed a peer-led shared decision-making clinical trial aid. It is available on our website at aiarthritis.org backslash clinical trials. And I'll make sure that I share this with you too, Petros, because I don't think that you're aware of this. It's fairly new. We've just launched it. And it is a novel shared decision-making tool, meaning it's different than others that might be out there because it was designed by patients for patients. And also, it, we have an option as you're filling it out with your family members or your doctor, and you can also have a link to contact us if you're stuck, if you have questions, you're like, I'm not sure how to bring this topic to my doctor. So we're going to give some recommendations for that as well, but this is designed so you could fill it out either before you ever see your doctor, after you see your doctor, or while talking to your doctor. So definitely, if you're thinking about clinical trials, we recommend taking a look. It's a free download. So go ahead and it's at, it's on our clinical trials page. And then I'm going to just fast forward to the next one because we already talked about it. But we want to encourage everyone to keep the conversation going. If you are not already in our Facebook group, we do have a Stills Disease Facebook group. And it is extremely active. I know a lot of you, I recognize a lot of names on in the chat. So I know many of you are participating in that already, but we're going to continue talking about this webinar and provide a link inside that group. And you'll meet many people from all over the world who are extremely helpful. And so we wanted to thank you again for participating and definitely thank you to uh, Petros for coming. This has been very, very informative and helpful. And we've really enjoyed spending time with you here today. Uh, the pleasure was all mine. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Everyone have a great rest of the day.